We join together in the hope of the gospel when we come to this Easter Sunday. It's different than all the other Sundays because we get to focus on that which brings us hope. And, and that point at which we encounter Christ at this moment is one of those unique uh, moments because we look and we worship with Christians around the globe uh, an empty tomb. It's an unusual thing to worship or to, to turn to for hope, and yet it, it's, it's a part of who we are. It's with that I want to turn to uh, 1 Corinthians <clears throat> excuse me, chapter 15. This is a portion of Scripture where Paul is beginning to encounter this new church, and he's beginning to talk to it because there's been some people who have been pushing against the resurrection. And they've been pushing against the resurrection, uh, saying all sorts of things. One is, of course, it's not true. How could it be true? And, and the Greeks were pushing against the resurrection. And Paul's going to, in apologetic style, begin to come back and talk about the people who saw Jesus. Over 500 people encountered the resurrected Christ, and it changed their life forever. Even when pressure was put on them to renounce that, they would not do it because of the encounter with Jesus Christ. And Paul wants to do that in order to, to help uh, people in Corinth begin to understand the good news of the resurrection. Well, it's the same for us. We have to encounter this good news and hear it as good news, but we have to wrestle with it with our minds and understand it. It's with that in mind that we go to this 1 Corinthians passage. I want you to listen. You can read along with me up on the screen as we read. It says this, For what I received, I pass on to you, is of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Now, I just want to stop there for a moment. Those of you who know the Apostles' Creed by heart, you'll notice the same language built into the Apostles' Creed. It came out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where he died, he was buried, and rose again. And that language kind of may have been embedded in your head if you knew the Apostles' Creed because you did it. Paul said it because he wanted to them to know that Jesus didn't just swoon or go into a coma or something like that. They wanted him to know he was buried. They wanted him to know he died, that he truly did, and that he rose again. So I'm going to read it again. This is of first importance that Christ died for us in our sins according to the Scripture, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. And then, then he appeared to Cephas, which is the Greek word for Peter, the apostle Peter. He appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living. They're still there. If you want to go ask them, go ask them. They're still alive. Most of them are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then after that, he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as one abnormally born. Now, he's going to describe that a little bit. I, I know some of you felt like your, at least your brother and sister were abnormally born, but you know, you, uh, the, he says, I was abnormally born, and, and Paul is talking about being born into the family of God, of being part of the Christian community, but he came at it a strange way. He came at it because he had been persecuting the church. Listen how he says it. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle. Because I persecuted the church of God, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked even harder than all of him, yet not I, but the grace of God that was in me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you have believed. Thus ends the reading of God's word. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Almighty God, I do thank you that we get to come to this moment and celebrate you as the risen Christ. Lord, I pray that we might hear this old story, for it is 2,000 years old, but it's as fresh as our next breath. That's what it means to worship you as God. And we're thankful for that, that we get to do this with Christians around the world. We pray for them. As it sweeps over this earth, Lord, I pray that you would be with the Christians in small huts and in large cathedrals who are proclaiming your name on this day. May we join our voices with them, Lord. For we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The year was 1,173 
It was a, a moment when a young architect was given a job that he had cherished. It was to build an eight-story bell tower. His name was Bonanno Pisano. I don't make these things up, folks. <laughs> Bonanno Pisano. Now, you know him because he was the architect of a tower that many of you have gone to see. It was an eight-story uh, bell tower that started to be built, but he, he, this young architect hadn't accounted for a couple things. Number one is that the ground was too soft. Number two, that his foundation was too shallow. And so it wasn't long after he started building when the tower began to lean. And you can imagine what it's called, right? The Leaning Tower of Pisa started to lean almost right away. And he realized his mistake but kept building, and the town wanted it so bad that it took them 175 years, but they completed it. Now, when they completed it, they tried to correct it. They tried to prop it up, or they changed the, the, the way they put the bricks on to kind of make it go straight, or look straight at least. But even when it was done, it was still leaning, almost 10%. And the Leaning Tower of Pisa was, Pisa was built. Did I say Pisa? Pisa was built, and it was built with the same lean that it started with. And that tower is a, an important lesson for any young architect, and it's true for us as well. It's that if your foundation is as strong, the building will not be what you want it to be. Jesus talked about this. In the Sermon on the Mount, he gave a little story. He said, uh, there was a man who built his house upon sand. And when the storms came, the sand washed away, and his home was disappeared. But there was a man who built his house upon a rock, and that rock, even when the storm came, did not disappear, but instead stood fast. Jesus wants to tell us the same thing. That it's the foundation upon which we build our life that determine where our life goes. And it's with that in mind that we go to this text today because Christian faith celebrates the foundation of our faith. You see, without it, there is no hope, and that foundation does not stand strong. Jean-Paul Sartre, who many of you read in college, was an existential philosopher. He was an atheist, and, and throughout his life, he struggled with the despair that he found even in his own philosophy as he was building it. Towards the end of his life, he said this as he lay on his deathbed. I know I shall die in hope. I know I shall die in hope. But then in profound sadness, he said, but hope needs a foundation that I don't have. A foundation that I don't have. Today we build our hope and we, we have that foundation, but it's built on something highly unusual. It's built on an empty tomb. Now the question is, how can you build a hope on something that's empty? For those of you who have traveled in Europe, you, you, you've probably gone to a lot of places, big cathedrals and other things, and the tour guide will immediately direct you to a tomb. And there they will celebrate or, or talk about the person who's buried there, whose bones are theirs. But Christians do something very different. They go to an empty tomb, and there they celebrate. And the question is, why in the world do you celebrate an empty tomb? Well, in order to know that, we have to go back into this old story. Because, well, we have to ask the question, is there any significance for you or for me in this story? Was it just an empty tomb that is a history that we talk about, or is it something that makes a difference in your life and mine? That's the question, you see. You know, any jeweler who's worth his stuff knows that in order to show off the qualities of a precious stone, they will slide underneath it a black cloth in order to make it stand out. And it's like that for us on this Easter week. These eight days that changed the world really took shape on that Good Friday. It was a dark day, and Christians look back on that dark day, even calling it Good Friday, but only in the aftermath can we call it that. It was a dark day because it was the day that Jesus died. And the disciples, now on Sunday morning, are gathered in the upper room. They're gathered in the upper room, and in this small room that they've rented, they're not there to declare victory. They're there because they've lost their resolve. They're not up in that upper room because they, they, they want to say everything's okay. They realize everything's gone wrong. 
In fact, all the things that they lost with Jesus dying did not just, were not just in the sum total of the corpse of their Messiah who lay in a tomb. It, it was many, many other things that they had lost. I mean, think about it. They had lost his teaching. How can we trust it? They, they, had, lost, they had lost the promises that Jesus had made. How, how can we believe them? They, they had lost the guarantees that he had given them. It was all gone. When that small band of Romans, along with some religious people, had taken Jesus' life, it was all dark. It was like sliding that dark mat underneath him because we didn't understand him as Jesus. For those of you who come to this service today who have known the pain of life, pain of despair, when you look at something that's happened in your life and you ask why, or, or for those of you who come today who have had uh, your hope put in somebody and they somehow disappointed you. For those of you who come and, and, and in some way you're more aware of your brokenness than your joy, you are uniquely qualified today to understand this story. Because it's out of that Good Friday that life came. But we have to understand that darkness. The disciples lost so much. It was not just the dead friend that they lost. Many of us have lost friends. But it was also all of the foundation they had built their life on. They had lost, for instance, hope. In that upper room, their hope was gone. And Jesus had promised them hope. But how could they trust it now? In Luke 24, 21, it says, But we hope that he was the one who was to redeem Israel. That was our hope. And it was all gone in that upper room. They had lost their courage. It had died. Jesus earlier on in his ministry in Matthew 14, 27 had said to them, take courage. Don't be afraid. It is I. And yet now it seemed all hollow. John 14, 1 said this, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. But how could they do it now? How could they believe his promise of eternal life? Where Jesus said in John 6 to Simon Peter, uh, these are the words of life. And he, he said, Simon, why don't you go if you don't believe them? And Simon Peter said, to whom shall we go? For only you have the words of eternal life. And now on that early Sunday morning, it was hard to believe, wasn't it? The promises and guarantees were gone. They had lost their peace. Jesus had said in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I don't give it to you as the world gives, but I give uh, it to you as I give. Let not your hearts be troubled. But peace eluded them. They had lost their joy. Jesus in John 15, 11 said this, I've told you this so that your joy may be complete, that my joy may be in you. What about forgiveness? Did it have any power anymore? Could you talk about forgiveness on that early Sunday morning? Jesus had said long ago to the paralytic he had healed, your sins are forgiven. Could you trust that on that Sunday morning? What about his claim that every person mattered? Did that really make sense anymore now that Jesus had died? You remember in the, in, in the Sermon on the Mount, we're going to look at it in the next couple of weeks, where Jesus said, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are they not much more valuable? And so are you more valuable than they are? They couldn't trust it anymore. They couldn't trust it. They weren't the only ones. Many men struggled on that morning when Jesus had died three days ago. There were two that a story is told about. They were on their road to Emmaus. They were walking towards Emmaus, and as they walked towards Emmaus, a man came up next to them, and this is what he said. He said, what are you discussing together as you walk? And one of them said, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know what's happened these last three days? And he said, well, what things? And they said, well, about Jesus of Nazareth. You so he, see, he was a prophet powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. 
But we had hoped that he was to be the one who was to redeem Israel. And what more, it's the third day since all this took place. Did you notice the incredible turn of phrase that occurred there? Those people on the road to Emmaus put two words together that should never be put together about Jesus. It's this. He was. He was. You see, that's not an Easter statement. And they were about to learn that on the road to Emmaus that day. He was. Becomes. He is. You see, when Jesus began to open themselves to them, he began to talk to them. And it says that he opened the scriptures, beginning with the very first, walked them through the scriptures to show that the Messiah was to come. And they said, hey, can we continue this conversation? He said, sure, what do you want to do? And they said, would you come have dinner with us? And they were in there having dinner with him when he took the bread that was on the table and he broke it after giving thanks. And immediately, it says, their eyes were opened. Their eyes were opened, and the world changed for them. Because from here he was, he became he is. The risen Christ came alive for them, and he appeared to all the other disciples. There was a time when he met the disciples up by the Sea of Galilee, and he walked up to them. They were scared, and they said, we can't believe this. And he said, just touch my side. Put your hand in my hands and feel the wounds. As you feel the wounds, they all stood back in this dejected group of people who had lost their hope and their joy and their peace. They had lost the promises of eternal life and forgiveness. All of it changed in a moment, for it was not he was, it was he is. And that's what Christians have said all along. That's why Easter is so important. When we come to to Easter, we, we don't say he was, Christ was risen. We say Christ is risen. In fact, Christians all over the world have been saying that all day long. For we serve a living God. And that's the good news of Easter. It is not a was, it is an is. And he's as close as our next breath. And he'll be there tomorrow with the same words of joy and peace and forgiveness and eternal life that he gave his disciples. It's not an old, old religion. It's as new as this breath. And as we celebrate that together, it becomes that living Christ who is present among us. You see, Christians have said that forever. He is risen. Yesterday, we were out at the Easter egg hunt, and one of the guys who was out there Uh, who's a member of our church, came up and he said, hey, Larry, um, you know, I've only been a Christian for a couple years. And I said, yeah, I got to baptize him. It was a wonderful event. And we we talked together. He said, you know, I've only been a Christian for a couple years. And he said, I don't really know what to say to people at Easter. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, do you say happy Easter? And I said, well, yeah, I mean, that's what everybody says. It's like Merry Christmas. You say Happy Easter. And he said, but you know what, Larry? I've been studying. It just doesn't seem to carry the weight of what this is all about. Happy Easter just doesn't seem to make it. And I said, well, that's why Christians have always said he is risen. This morning, as pastors will do, I woke up early At 5.30 in the morning, I already had a bunch of texts from friends of mine all around the country. And you know what it said? He is risen. And the response for Christians throughout history has been the same response. He is risen indeed. As we come to this Easter Sunday, I I just hope you have encountered that God. It is not Jesus was, but it's Jesus is. And as we come to this moment, we can proclaim it with Christians around the world. For he is risen. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen risen indeed. Let's pray together. Almighty God, I thank you that you are the risen one. You are the one who has given us life. Now, Lord, may we live into that. Help us to understand that as the risen Christ comes into our lives, that joy can return, that peace can make its home there, that our foundation can be strong and we can build our home upon it. 
For you are risen, Lord. You are risen indeed. And we pray all these things in the name of the risen Christ, who taught us 